Hey, Brian Beeler back with you here in the Storage Review Lab. I know we've been talking a lot about this HP micro server, and the reason we're talking so much about it is that you guys are talking so much about it. And maybe we're feeding each other. Either way, it's all good stuff. We finally have the missing link to finish this review or to get this performance review started, and that is the 16 gig DIMM we were waiting on from HPE. So it's finally arrived. It comes in the uh, HPE shipping box for this. So let's go ahead and see what's inside. Make sure that's all cool. Then we will install the RAM module. And then we'll go back to uh, VMware and Kevin can get our database testing started for this review. Ah, look, good thing I went through the bottom because there it is. And it's nice little tray. We don't have the drama of removing the paper in this one, but we do have the module nicely packed with a secure label. So this is what it looks like when you buy the good stuff. Well, all the stuff we get's good, but we don't buy it. So it doesn't always show up in such a pretty little thing with a little foil wrapper. Kind of makes me feel like uh, I just got a really fancy baseball card. You know, when you buy those, those sets or you even just get the, the one pack every now and then you get the shiny one. Ah, Pokemon, they do those too. They're just shiny Charizard. That's what we've got here. We've got the Charizard of uh, uh, UDIMs from HPE. So I'm just going to quickly take this guy apart, remove the, uh, the, uh, the tray here, get that out of the way. Remove these two screws. And this will just slide out again as we've done a couple times and we'll be able to uh, simply drop in the dim. We'll give it a rotation here so we can all see together. Unclip. Cut the shiny foil. And now we are in business. So this guy will just drop in right next to it and that will take us up to our uh, 32 gig advertised limit on, uh, on the RAM. Now there have been a number of questions around will it support more and it may. We simply don't have the UDIMs around to, uh, to do that exercise at the moment though that may be something we come back to later. So what we're going to do is get this guy back together, run it back up to the main lab, and then we'll join in again from uh, our VMware console. And Kevin will get some workloads running. We're going to start with our database workloads that are virtualized. And we'll be able to do a, a lightweight SQL server and MySQL on this guy and uh, start to show those results maybe as soon as uh, the next day or two. So we'll be right back with that cut. All right, so we took the microserver back up to the main lab, plugged it in, and Kevin grabbed a coffee. I came down to get set up for recording, and the to Kevin's delight, the machine, once it got power, booted itself, and our uh, tab was already ready to roll when we got in here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of surprised. I mean, there were no faults. I was concerned that you didn't click in both sides of the uh, DRAM module. I did squeeze hard on that right one a little bit to get them in, but uh, did they show up? Do we dive yes. into the hardware? Yeah, system health is uh, completely green. And in this area, we get to see that all the main uh, primary components are uh, checking out. Except okay. for the unknown network. Yes, uh, there's some things this thing wasn't designed for, but I guess that's one of them. Uh, so we go into memory. And we see our 32 gigabytes uh, available. No one could be more proud of myself right now than I am. Yes. Okay, so ILO works, and we're going to run two sets of benchmarking on this device. We're going to do a set of bare metal, assuming you get Linux operational, and we'll save that for later this week. And we're also going to do some work in VMware. And in that scenario, you've got a couple database workloads. Correct. Yeah, we're doing our... Uh normal SQL Server workload as well as our Sysbench uh, MySQL test. And those are uh, 
kind of toned down from how we normally test all flash arrays. And a lot of it's around the uh, four cores and 32 gigabytes of memory in this platform. I guess this technically is an all flash server. <laughs> and now it's an all flash storage server for presenting the drives of VMware. So you're saying we should change the uh, YouTube titles for this? Yes, yeah, all flash storage servers. Okay. All right. So what are we going to do? Go into VMware now and check things out? Yeah. In this area, we had our uh, little vCenter client up and running through the uh, the host itself and um, basically verified that it saw the memory as well. Okay. And then we pulled it into our uh, normal uh, vCenter environment. Now, you've done that already. Yeah. So normally, you could just walk through that process pretty easily, but you don't really want to show everyone our VMware keys? Yeah, we had that little snafu earlier, <laughs> and I uh, decided that I probably don't want to share my near-unlimited keys with the entire world. How fast would our CPU count climb if, if those keys were just put out there into the world? Uh, I think it's managed locally, but uh, VMware would probably be seeing multiple hits on the exact same license keys. and oh, send us that very we angry. get a nasty email. Yeah. All right, so what are we doing now? So now we have our uh, server uh, fully visible. Everything's checking out. And we're going to go in here and uh, verify that the software adapter is added. So this is going to allow us to use our 25 gig card and attach to uh, our uh, NetApp uh, AFF uh, A200. Okay. So for people that don't fully understand our environment, what are we using the A200 for? So we're using the A200 for our uh, lab shared storage. So that's where we uh, have as a kind of a holding space for a lot of the workloads that we use in our testing, some production uh, environment uh, going on, but um, it's really so as we're moving around different pre-built workloads, it's a spot for them to sit and then we migrate onto uh, the device that we're testing. So in our parlance, we would call that production storage in as far as our test lab is any sort of production. Yes. And uh, yeah, the A200 was one we reviewed some time ago, came in off flash, and that's another one where we just sort of didn't send it back, right? And then... We were allowed to keep it around just because we were being productive and then maybe it, we stuck around so long that uh, they didn't want it back anymore. Yeah. We licked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that the, the trick? The trick is either to lose one drive caddy or to lick the, the storage server. Yeah. So now we've uh, scanned the uh, iSCSI and it's seen uh, is it's seen two targets. Uh, this would be both controllers on the uh, A200, and uh, now we gotta take our IQN name and put it into um, the uh, secure initi the initiator security uh, screen on our A200. And this way, uh, our uh, volumes will then appear on. Uh, that side. Okay, so you're logged into the the ONTAP manager uh, on the A200 at this point. Yes. And hopefully, oh, it went green. All right, good. Yeah, I actually haven't used the um, uh, new ONTAP interface for uh, much more than the uh, newer visibility components. I've gotten so used to where things were on the old <laughs> interface. But well, that, that's a classic problem, right? Is we get comfortable with something, and even though they make it better, firm use of air quotes, it's sometimes difficult for old dog, new trick, right? Yeah, I mean, things get more optimized. It's probably better for uh, certain workflows, but it's like if you're used to like the muscle memory of like, okay, I'm used to seeing the thing right there, and now it's, you got to dig through it again. All right, so what happened? So we are trying to get our... Um, uh, VMs installed on here, and uh, we're starting to see maybe we do need to use the old interface. Uh oh, what have you done? Exactly. <laughs> so, we're gonna switch to the classic version and see where we went wrong. All right, this does happen from time to time in real life and in test lab where maybe it didn't work out on the first try. Yeah, and this is one where. I mean, it's the downside of new interface. Uh, so you're used to the same approach each time. You read the manual, right? Manuals? What? You've taken a certification course on ONTAP? Um, you mean by emailing the right person? Yes. <laughs> yeah, but halfway into a video, we're not supposed to be emailing Joe for help. Joe, help. All right, but you're going to fix it by going to the legacy interface yeah so we have uh, some initiators set up for our um uh, we call it our mixed environment the both uh, fiber channel and iSCSI and this way 
Have you figured out what you've done wrong yet? I might have added into one of the other groups. I don't really know, but since we don't have any uh, storage present in that area any, uh, currently, that might explain why uh, it's not showing up. Except for when this rescan happens. Yes, drum roll. Insert audio for drum roll. So this roll is the now. point where we either throw this video away and start over, mm. or it works. It's there. See? Ah, yes. No throwing away video. It always makes me a bit sad when we have to throw away a video. So here we can see the uh, data stores for different lab components. So we have our bulk uh, lab, our core lab, <laughs> SQL VMs, and Sysbench. What's the difference between bulk lab and core lab? I've not even noticed I had to give unique names. So one's on controller A, one's on controller B. We kind of split it up. I'm kind of um, surprised you didn't use Marvel superhero names. Until next time, I guess. We could have, well, bulk could easily be swapped out for Hulk lab and iron man lab okay well here let's see uh it'll probably break our uh would you quit messing around okay. well you're giving me good ideas all so. right carry on so right now we're going to uh, find our uh, sql vm and uh, this guy we're going to use the search box and we're going to just migrate this uh, vm over to uh, the new server do you ever migrate vm2 when you're using just one vm or three or four it doesn't matter they're all clones of one another so usually it does not have that huge of impact but well i just i can make them all feel happy well, that's what i'm saying from a vm utilization standpoint if one is used every single time and two three and four only get to play on larger machines i think that's sort of unfair yeah so before we can go and switch it over these VMs are set up to work on kind of bigger servers. So they have 16 vCPUs allocated, and this guy has four. So hmm. before we go in here, uh, we're going to change both the uh, CPU count and the amount of RAM this guy has. So you're editing that at the VM level. Yes. So what, I guess I wasn't paying attention. It just threw an error because you were trying to allocate more resources than we have. Yeah, so on a lot of these VMs, you can't have... Um, you can't really oversubscribe more than the total ser uh, CPUs available in that server. You can kind of fudge the numbers with um, allocating more CPU resources across all the VMs and those aggregate more than the host, but you really have to have at least the resources in that host for one VM. Okay, so we've dropped our CPU count. And now we're going to lower this guy to uh, 29. The other three you've left for system. Yeah, it was using about uh, it was like 1.6 or something. And I figured I wanted to leave it just a little bit. All right, so you went with a nice even number of 29. Yes. See, compatibility checks succeeded. Yay. So that guy's moved over. And now uh, we get our suspension. Uh, via moved over and this guy is still on we'll turn this guy off so we can move it now if you just gave the four cores to the sql server vm how do we get this one on there well they don't both have to be powered on at the same time so as long as they're not both operational we're okay correct okay so as this guy shuts down and uh, sometimes I want to be a little more gentle on these guys and let them uh, go up uh, or power down safely. Uh, we'll come back to that guy in a second. So for our uh, SQL Server VM, one thing we also had to check is to make sure that um, the VLAN for the network vSwitch is uh, talking uh, all with the uh, other lab infrastructure. So before we go in there, we're going to go to uh, configure and back to our um, virtual switches. And in here, the uh, default guy needs to have a VLAN ID set. So when we configured the uh, management network, um, the VM kernel got to talk on uh, VLAN 20, but uh, since the v uh, VM kernel and the vSwitch are in two separate areas, we need to make sure that's up and running as well. Otherwise, when we power on that VM, it would just be kind of screaming to no one. It would be there, but completely. That's sometimes how I feel in this building, is screaming to no one. Yes. I am just like an untagged VLAN now. I've figured it out. Okay. 
So this guy is uh, powered off, and uh, since it probably had some storage attached to it, we're going to go in here and delete that storage to make sure that it is fully unattached. That so, is not unattached. Yeah, so delete that. And the, so when we set up these uh, VMs um, on our Sysbench test, most of the VM uh, is operating on... Um, the shared storage environment and then the database that's under test is inserted onto the storage that we uh, are uh, stressing in this case microserver gen 10 plus yes so now we go to this uh, same routine that we did on the uh, sql vm and we're going to lower this guy to 16 vcpus from 16. oh from 16 to 4. there we go yeah and then Come on, buddy. The same 29 gigabytes. Uh -oh. Let's see what that little warning is. Oh, the reservation. Okay, so. Let's uncheck that and recheck it. And we are good to go. Migrate this one over to our uh, microserver, which is not visible yet. Uh-oh, where'd it go? It might be that this VM is currently also sitting on different shared storage. So in our environment, we have FiberChannel and uh, FiberChannel iSCSI mixed. And of course, this is on our trusty uh, FiberChannel array. So we're going to move this guy over to our Sysbench before we move it over. But these are basically the steps we go through on a normal basis. So we're moving uh, workloads around in our uh, lab continuously. Um, and a lot of it comes down to how different workloads are uh, being stressed. So a Sysbench, we need all these VMs to come online at the same time. And for the workloads where if it's eight or under, it usually sits on the, um, the NAP array. When it's uh, greater than that, we have a, uh, a fairly substantial all flash array just for those uh, it's a single control all flash array but it keeps everything consistent the downside though it's fiber channel only and you probably should have pulled up the uh, the routing chart and resource allocation document that you consult regularly every time you do this process it's my cup of coffee <laughs> It's the grounds at the bottom of the cup of coffee that I look at. Oh, fantastic. So you, you're literally guessing and reading the tea leaves in this case? Yes. But in that case, our, uh, our microserver it will be uh, ready to go in a fairly short period of time. And uh, we'll be kicking off those workloads. Each of those takes about uh, three and a half hours to run. So barring any midnight snacks, I will have both these uh, workloads finished by the morning. All right. Well, until then, we will get this video up. People can see what it's like in the nittiest and grittiest parts of the storage review VMware lab. Your lucky beard didn't get sloshed across this notebook. Yeah, that was Friday was a rough day. If you check out the podcast, you'll learn more about that. But uh, today we're back to bubble water and, uh, and good vibes with the uh, vSphere client. So we're going to work on this, get the benchmarks rolling, and should have some results very, very soon on the virtualized database testing. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.